Hello, and welcome back. We continue to talk about section 5.3 today. We are going to tackle in this video, let's see, we've already covered these first couple of learning objectives in previous videos. Today we're going to try to get into the, the big guy here, fundamental theorem of calculus, and use it to compute definite integrals. So let's see if we can get ourselves to the right slide. All the way down here. There we go. Okay, so <laughs> this has a pretty big name, uh, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. You might wonder, okay, how can I make it through uh, a term and a little bit of calculus without ever seeing something called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus? But um, uh, it, it is a fairly substantial, it's a, it's a big deal, as they say. But um, we've, it, the reason it hasn't come up to this point and didn't come up in your first quarter differential calculus class um, is that it involves integration. But, but the great thing about it is it actually does connect the antiderivative stuff that you've been doing for the first couple of sections with the definite integral piece that we've been talking about for these last couple of videos. So uh, <laughs> if you've been wondering this whole time, why are we doing all these things with area? Why do we care about triangles and area under, under parabolas and this new definite integral thing? This is the theorem that kind of puts it together for us. So uh, the considerations here are the kind of the usual. We've got f of x is continuous. We've got some interval. Um, and so basically, remember that this, uh, this left side thing here, this is just area. So we're defining this definite integral basically to be the area under f of x between the endpoints a and b. And, uh, and then, so this is the great thing. So we can find this definite integral approximately using the Riemann sum strategies, adding up all these areas of rectangles and whatnot. Um, but we can actually find, no, this is not approximately equal to, this is actually an equal to sign. We can find the value of this area exactly by knowing an antiderivative of little f. So we're gonna call uh, an antiderivative capital F and basically, all you have to do is evaluate it at the two endpoints, evaluate it at B and at A, and subtract them. Um, this is pretty remarkable. Um, but one thing I want to comment on before we get any further is that this word any, uh, you'd sort of expect to say uh, we need some specific antiderivative, or, or even maybe to say the general solution here. Uh, but that's actually not the case. We can pick any antiderivative, and remember, there are infinitely many of them that are all just vertical shifts of one another. Um, the, uh, we can pick any one of those, use them in this formula, and come up with this exact area, the exact value of this definite integral. Um, so let's see how this plays out in practice, because this will be a, a big part of what we do for computations moving forward. So this is kind of a, a standard deal, but uh, if you watched any of the earlier videos, you might recall that we studied this function before. Um, this, this was in example one, part B. We had this parabola, y equals four minus x squared. We were approximating the area underneath its curve and above the x-axis. We did that using four rectangles. And we got something that, you know, we could feel okay about, but it certainly wasn't going to be perfect. There were definitely, uh, it was definitely an overestimate, for instance. But this computation, if we can make this happen, will get us the exact area under this curve, which is pretty remarkable. So here's a reminder to compare your answer. Um, so let's see what we can do. Uh, all right, so because it's a definite integral and we've got this new found machinery, this fundamental theorem of calculus to help us out, we don't have to use the Riemann sum anymore. We can actually use an exact thing. The, but the first thing we've got to do along that process is to figure out what's an antiderivative of the inside of this integral. In other words, an antiderivative of 4 minus x squared. Um, and then there's a little note there just, by the way, remember we we're using that same little swirly integral symbol both for the stuff we were doing earlier in this chapter for indefinite integration, finding antiderivatives, families of antiderivatives, we're, but we're also using it for this definite integral where you use the same symbol, but there's just an A and a B written. And that here's this fundamental theorem of calculus is where we first start to see why it feels okay to use the same notation for those because they're both talking about antiderivatives. Okay, so here's, here's how we would proceed. We, this is the, the indefinite integral. And remember, all we have to do here is, is with some, some power rule. Uh, we're going to take each of these uh, terms, the two terms here, four, 
Uh, remember, this is technically like an x to the 0 sitting next to this guy. So its exponent's going to go up to 1. We would divide by that normally, but OK, fine, it's still just 4. Um, x squared is going to go up to x cubed, divide by the new power. And since it's an indefinite integral, we're including the plus c. So we're going to say this is a perfectly reasonable capital F of x for us to use in that statement of the, of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we can say, look, take this and then basically plug in those two endpoints, plug in two and zero. And the notation for this usually looks something like that, where we've got parentheses or brackets around the, the, um, the antiderivative. And then we have this vertical line with the two limits of integration there, zero and two. And this basically says, take the two, plug it in for all the x's, and then subtract what you get when you plug in zero for all of the x's. So this is kind of a, a kind of handy notation for that. So then we'd say, at this point, uh, the c's might be a little bit of a concern, but we've, uh, we'll be able to work th through this. Um, because look, we've got numbers here, and then uh, what's great is once you subtract, this is actually c and then minus something else with c's in it. So it, in fact, the c terms don't matter at all. What we get is just um, a, a real number and, and all as well. So this is kind of interesting and maybe worth talking about a couple of pieces. So um, we were instructed to compare this to uh, the example one part B. And uh, if you look back at that previous video, then you might notice we got a 6.25 for our estimate using the rectangles. And then 16 thirds, the answer we just got is approximately 5.333, uh, you know, 5.3 repeating exactly. So we were we were kind of right we we thought that 6.25 was high we weren't sure exactly how much too high but we, we were pretty good this 5.3 repeating is the exact area underneath that parabola which is kind of weird right we didn't have a formula for area under a parabola but now we kind of do because we know how to find antiderivatives of of things using power rule um, and then the second observation was and I'll, I'll go back to this in just a second so we can see it but the c actually was not necessary so we could have just used that exact same expression without c in it and gotten the same 5.3 repeating value that we got otherwise um, and that's because when you take f of b and then you subtract f of a if there's a constant in this term it's also going to be present in this term when you subtract them they're going to go away so uh, just to go back to, to, to notice that, so here we could have basically removed this C term entirely. We could have just used a particular antiderivative where C was zero um, because in the end, this was just gonna get cut out. And you could imagine maybe to make this clearer, if that doesn't really make much sense, then think like, oh, pick your favorite number. It's plus seven because we get to pick it anyway. If this was plus seven, you'd have a plus seven here. You'd also subtract that seven, so it wouldn't have made any impact on this answer. So no matter what C is, it disappears from this definite integral calculation. I want to stress that doesn't mean it's irrelevant for antiderivatives in general. If we're doing an indefinite integral, there's no numbers on this integral. We really do still need that arbitrary constant to, to remind us of the fact that this is a whole family of solutions. This isn't just one function. It's a whole bunch of them. So those are our observations. Uh, we're gonna try out another exercise that also kind of harkens back to a problem that we uh, approximated earlier on in the, the videos for this section. So we're in charge of finding the exact area between this graph, x-axis, and the lines x equals one, and, uh, sorry, x equals negative two and x equals one. I, it's, it's worth kind of mentioning here, this seems sort of sneaky, but um, these, this last little piece is basically just telling us that we're on the interval. Uh, so IE, the interval negative two to one. Um, it, it's phrased a little bit differently, but that's all that means. If you have a vertical line at X equals negative two and a vertical line at one and those sort of block off stuff in the middle, then that's exactly where we were. Uh, in example two in particular. So the video, the previous video, we, we, we looked at approximating this using a Riemann sum. Now we're gonna see if we can get an exact answer. So uh, the area would be the definite integral. So here's our f of x inside here. Um, it is going from negative two to positive one. And uh, oh, before we, just as a reminder, what we need here is step one is essentially an antiderivative. 
and I do mean an, not the antiderivative, because there's infinitely many of them, and we also don't really care about a bunch of them. We just need any particular one to work for us. In order to do that, you might notice this is a little too complicated just for power rule or for our e to the kx rule to tackle. Um, so instead, we're going to have to try out some other strategy, and the main one we've got so far is substitution. So with a substitution of the exponent, then you might pick uh, u equals negative x squared. And the advantage to that is uh, we've all got this other x factor that we... <laughs> I don't mean that in like the x factor, like the show or the, the you know, uh, other, other, any other interpretation of the word. I literally mean a factor multiple of x. Um, and this substitution with its derivative will help us get rid of that. So if we take this uh, du expression and uh, we divide off, and the, everybody does this kind of a different way, but if we, if we use this to basically solve for dx, that's the strategy I've been, been implementing so far, um, then we have this entire expression that gets replaced for dx, and so our integral is going to look like here's the original setup, and then all this stuff gets dumped in. Let's maybe do a little color coding. We can see where all this stuff came from. You know, I'm sure you're getting good at substitution here, but uh, here is the entire expression that gets plugged in for, um, for dx and then ends up as this right here. And so the, integra the integrand, the rest of it, uh, the exponent turned into u um, because that was our substitution. And then the thing you might notice that's encouraging here is that uh, the x's are going to cancel. So let's show that as well. So uh, we've got a factor of x on top, a factor of x on the bottom. And so we can pull out that negative 1 half. But other than that, there's only u's in the integral, uh, which is always comforting when we do substitution. We've made a full transition from the original x variable <coughs> to our, our uh, substituted variable u. Okay, I've also included, just like we do with substitution in, in, in general, um, a, a reminder that these limits of integration are not u values. As soon as we start switching over and, and have this potential confusion between x's and u's, I, I, we put this explicit reminder on the, the, the limits of integration that, no, no, remember, these really were x values. So don't get carried away and plug in negative 2 for u. Because it's not saying that u is negative 2, it's saying that x is negative 2. And there'll be one of two ways we can handle that. Um, so, so moving forward, I, I guess the best thing we can say about where we are right now is this is a perfectly computable integral. These, these, this integrand is, is uh, pretty manageable. So integral of e to the u is still e to the u. We have this factor of negative 1 half sitting out in front. And I've still got this reminder that our limits of integration are x values, x equals negative 2 to x equals positive 1. As soon as we go back to x's, these, the u served its purpose. It, it helped us compute this integral. So as soon as you go back to x's, then these limits don't need that reminder anymore. You could still write x equals 1, x equals negative 2. That's fine. But here there's less risk for confusion because x was the original variable anyway. And then just as a reminder, again, this vertical slash means plug in 1 for all of your variable, plug in negative uh, 2 for all of your variables, and then subtract the results. This negative 1 half is just kind of hanging out in front. So uh, there's an exact answer if, if, we're, if we're focused on exactitude here. Uh, if we want to know an approximate, there it is, negative 1.75, or sorry, 0.175. I think the main reason for that is we also want to compare this result to our approximate from example two, and uh, let, let's do that as well. Um, so first observation though is that uh, areas in quotation marks it's negative, and remember uh, as we as as I, as I mentioned in the previous video, this is basically just a, a function of the outputs being negative in certain parts of the graph. So if you're below the x-axis, then you're going to accumulate in some sense. I'm doing air quotes here, although you can't see me. Negative area, whatever that means. Um, but, but again, this, this actually does have meaningful interpretations if we think about negative profits or negative temperature, for instance. Um, so, uh, and then the second observation is that if we compare our result to what we got in example two, uh, our answer right here was negative 0.175. The estimate was substantially more negative. And that's mostly because uh, we, we were kind of more weighted on the values close to the left side of that negative 2 to 1 interval. And they happen to be, the, the function outputs happen to be lower on that side. So this gave us a, a value that's an underestimate. It's too negative 
compared to the, the actual value. So there's a couple of examples illustrating the use of the fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll come back in the next video and we'll tackle uh, the last part of the section.